This sermon was preached at Crossway Church in Battleground, Washington. It's part of our series, 1 Corinthians, Viewing Life Through the Gospel Lens. We hope that you're challenged and encouraged by it. Uh, I don't know if you know it, but this past summer was the Olympic Games. And most of you know that the Games actually originated in Greece. What you may not know is that they weren't the only town to actually have the games. As a matter of fact, Corinth, the town that we are looking at in the book of Corinth, because that's the where the letter the, the church was that Paul wrote to, hence the name 1 Corinthians, had the Isthmian games. Now, here's the interesting thing. It had an interesting mix. It actually was a bunch of uh, Greek games like wrestling and races and those kind of things with also a competition of poetry. So... If there's a new term for poetry slam, wrestling and poetry going in the same thing, that might be one. Um, but the fact of the matter is, is it had everything for everyone. And the winners actually won a crown, and it was made out of fur, and before that it was made out of another plant. But um, that was the prize that the winners got. And so this is the context that Paul is writing in, in our text here today. Now, most coaches, I know one coach here in uh, our own uh, congregation, that will say that success isn't just natural talent. It's also how much you're willing to put work you're put, willing to put in when nobody's looking. And, and most of the times we know that good athletes are uh, not only naturally talented, but they're willing to put in the time. And oftentimes they not only are willing to put in the time, but they have good coaches who are willing to push and get, help bring the best out of them, but also warn them. And I want this image of coach to be in your mind because this is exactly what the Apostle Paul is trying to do in our text. If I would say in this letter, he is trying to be a spiritual father or a spiritual coach to the Corinthians. If you remember, we're in a section of the letter where he's actually answering questions that they have. And he is responding to them. And he's dealing with this whole idea of idols and meat sacrifice to idols. And really what he's telling us to do is that we need to put the needs of others, especially weaker Christians or non-Christians, ahead of our own preferences. And we need to be willing to give up our own rights and those kind of things. Oh, but today he's going to continue that argument, but he's instead going to help us look at Israel's history and say that we need to be careful. Because if there's something that's going to keep us from growing in our faith, and there's, if there's anything that's going to keep us from moving forward in, in life, it is overconfidence and putting a confidence in ourselves rather than in the work of God. And so he's going to look at what happens when we kind of puff ourselves up when we kind of think more highly of ourselves and the sins that we can kind of get into, and he's going to warn against that in this text. He's going to look at the history of Israel, specifically the Exodus where they wandered in the wilderness and their reaction to God, and tell us, hey, be careful, because if you're not careful, you're going to fall into the same trap that they are. And so this, uh, this is kind of where we're going here today. So if you want to turn with me in your Bibles, we will be in 1 Corinthians 9, verse 24, all the way through 10, 13. Uh, the passages that we could have maybe looked at them separately, but I think that they all, I mean, Paul wanted the whole letter, the letter to be read at one shot. So I think we can look at these two together. Uh, but this is the word of the Lord. Do you not know that in a race, all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last. But we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud, that they passed through the sea, that they were all baptized into Moses into the cloud and the sea, and they ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them, and their bodies were scattered in the wilderness." Now, these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry. We should not commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 of them died. We should not test Christ as some of them did and were killed by snakes. And do not grumble as some of them did and were killed by the destroying angel. These things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us 
on whom the culmination of the ages had come. And so if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And as God is faithful, he will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide you a way out so that you can endure it. As I said, this is the word of the Lord. Now, uh, this, uh, Paul weaves a bunch of different examples in here. As I said, the main example that he uses in the very beginning is that of idea of a race or a competition. And really what he's hitting at that is to try to get us to think about this. That to achieve life's goals, you must work at it. You know, um, sometimes we think that we can just get these things and they'll naturally happen to us. But the fact of the matter is, is you don't become a great guitar player by just picking up the guitar and doing nothing with it. It takes practice. And that is the same with the, uh, any good athlete or anybody who does anything. It, it, you, in order to achieve life's goal, you must work at it. And you must act on things. And so what Paul is saying is the Christian life is like a race. If you've ever run a long distance race, now I, I'm not a long distance runner. I know you, you may look at me and think otherwise. I'm joking. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, is that I, I don't. Swimming is more my game. Uh, but you know, when you're swimming laps or when you're swimming a race, you get to a certain spot where you kind of you kind of feel like I don't know if I can continue to do this anymore. You you kind of hit the hit hit a roadblock and and you you wonder, man, is it even worth it? And Paul says it's worth it. And he says you're in the Christian life, you're going to go through moments like that. You're going to you're going to go through all kinds of highs and lows and you need to keep on pressing on and you need to shoot for the goal. You need to shoot for the prize. And what he says is the prize isn't just a temporary thing. It's not the crown that the Corinthians got in their Ismian uh, uh, Olympics. But rather instead, the prize is a resurrected life with Christ. And so he says, run in such a way as you get that prize. And he says, look, shoot for that ambition to be able to spend all eternity with God and to become more and more like Christ here on earth. He says, this is the ultimate prize that you can shoot for in life. But as I said, he also says that it requires training. And he says, this is in a running metaphor. He says, every runner has to run. And so if you want to grow in your Christian life, we need to act on things. We need to do the things that help us draw closer to God. Be part of a community. Read the word. Pray. All those kind of things. He uses the imagery of a boxer. He says, we need to fight our own internal sin nature and put it to death. And we need to, to work on those kind of things. It doesn't happen easily. And it doesn't happen naturally. It takes work and it takes effort. <coughs> But he encourages the Corinthians to do exactly that. To think about what it is that they're aiming for. To think about what it is that they're shooting for. And to target that. And to spend their time and their energy and their resources on what really matters. And so today I want you to think about that. What is it that you are aiming for in life? What is it that you're shooting for? Oftentimes we, we don't think about this. We just kind of go through life. Or even if we have, it's easy for us to get distracted and to not think about it that much anymore. But Paul is saying is, what is it that you want to accomplish with your life? And what is it that you want to do? It's important for us to think about this. The ultimate thing in our lives should be our relationship with God and faith in him and doing the things that God has prepared us to do. And so is that what is really dominating our life as much as we think? That's the question that Paul is asking for us. Now, like every good coach, he's, he's encouraging us. He's pushing us. Hey, you're hitting these hard spots. In the Corinthian church, there's all kinds of chaos happening. There's all kinds of things happening. In, and he's saying, look, don't get caught up in all this. Just push forward in your faith. Keep on moving forward. Aim for that end of life where you know you'll spend all eternity with Christ. And, and do the things that you need to do to continue down that road. And trust that God is at work. We'll see that here in a little bit. But he says, also, like any good coach, he warns them. We spent a bunch of games, volleyball games, in Kelso yesterday. Annika played in a tournament. And how many times did the coach says, hey, it's coming over here. Watch out for this. That's what a good coach does, right? They, they say, go do this in a positive way, but also look out for this. There's a warning system. Well, Paul does 
this as well. He encourages them to move forward in their faith, but he also warns them about different mistakes that they can make. I love the quote from Winston Churchill, those who fail to learn from history are doomed to repeat it. We kind of forget that he said that after World War II, a few years after World War II, which if you know World War II, they didn't learn the histories of World War I, and so they did repeat it. And what Paul is saying to us is very much the same thing. He's saying that God has given us not only the story of the Israelites to show how God has worked throughout history, but to serve as a warning for us. To serve to say that if we're not careful, we need to make sure that we don't fall into those same traps. And so he says it right there in 1 Corinthians 1 verse 10, 11. These things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings to us. And that's what he's saying to us. We need to take heed on this. And so what he lays out is kind of what God has done for the people of Israel and what their response was. And newsflash, it wasn't good. That's why it's a warning. But what he says here is that, the, that Christ was at work in the Israelites' lives. Now, in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 3 through 4, he gives the same long list of how God worked in their lives. He, 10, verse 3 and 4, he says, They ate from the same spiritual food. They drank from the same spiritual drink. They drank from the rock that accompanied them. And then it says that there was this rock that was Christ. And it was spiritual. Now, some of us may say, well, I mean, how is Christ a rock? Well, on some senses, it could be symbolic. Christ is a rock as a symbol of strength and security. I mean, financial people often use rocks as images for them. We're sturdy. We're strong. You can trust us. We're going to put, to put our money in because we'll take care of you. And I think Paul is communicating that. He's saying that God was the rock. Christ was the rock guiding the people of Israel throughout there. But also it's that God provided for them. He was at work in them. Multiple times throughout the story of, of the wilderness experience, the people were thirsty and they had nowhere to drink in a desert. And, and God provided water miraculously from that rock. And what he wants us to see is that Christ is ultimately that provider for the people of Israel. It's interesting that the Jews had a popular legend back in Jesus' day, that that rock actually followed the people of Israel around in the desert because it's mentioned in the beginning and the end. Now, it's a legend. It's not, you know, but I think what Paul is trying to get at here is this idea that Christ is always with them and was with them, even in the Old Testament. And he was their source of strength and security, and he was their provider. And he wants them to see that that's also true for us today. And he lists the different ways that God provided them. I mean, God liberated them miraculously from Israel, from Egypt. If you remember, the people of Israel were slaves in Egypt and they had no hope. Things were desperate. The Egyptians were cracking down on them and they, their life seemed hopeless. And all of a sudden he sent Moses out of the blue to save them. And he did miraculous ten plagues. And then this amazing thing where they're going out of the land of Egypt with all the thousands and thousands of people. And they come to the Red Sea and the, the Egyptians are behind them. And they don't know how they're going to get through. And God does this miracle. It's the parting of the waters. And, and what he does is Moses lifts up his hand and God parts the Red Sea so they can walk through it. And then if you remember, it says that then what happened is the Egyptians came. And just as the Israelites got over, then the, the Egyptians were swept away. If there's ever a story of a miraculous saving that is beyond my comprehension, that is it. And you would think, as I look at that, if, that, if God liberated me in that big of a way that I would remember it, it would sink into my heart. It didn't for them. But not only that, God directed their steps, Paul says. And he talks about this cloud that he's talking about. He says that they, that they were all under the cloud. In Exodus 13 and many other places, it talks about a pillar of a cloud that God had in front of the people of Israel. That was a cloud by day, which if you think about it, would be an awesome thing when you're in the desert and provide you some shade right from the heat. When we were in Turkey, I got to tell you, it was 110. I, I would have died for a cloud. But it was a, also a pillar of fire at night. And so they had this sign that their God who had delivered them was still leading and guiding them by this cloud. And, and he says they, God directed their steps. And not only that, 
They were in the wilderness and they were vulnerable and they had no source of food. And what did God do? He provided for their spirit, their physical needs as well. He provided water, as we said, by striking the rock. And he also said that he provided them food. Now, if you know the story of, of uh, the, the wilderness at all, in Exodus 16 and other places, it talks about how God provided this manna, which was like this honey bread type thing that they could eat and they could gather and every day God would bring it on the six days. And the seventh day they, they couldn't do it because they were supposed to rest. But on the six days they would gather it and they would get all the food that they needed. And even when they grumbled, God provided quail in one day. And so what we see, Paul says, is look, God gave them liberation. God gave them direction. God gave them physical needs. This is what God did. But here's the thing. The Israelites took God's work in their lives for granted. Now, as you can see, I kind of am a little judgmental of these Israelites. You know, I kind of look at them and go, if God worked in that way in my own life, I would not forget it. <laughs> and I thought about that as I was preaching. And then I had this conviction that it was like, hmm, I don't think that's the case. Because I got to admit that God has worked in my own life in pretty big ways. And yet I can let the anxieties of, cry, uh, of life creep in more than I would care to admit. And when I allow those anxieties to overcome you, in some senses, what I am doing is I am forgetting all the stuff that God has done for me. God liberated me from a life of sin. God is guiding and directing me. And it may not be in a dramatic way, but he is still guiding my life and shaping it even when I don't see it. And, and he's provided me with, me with way more than I could ever imagine. I heard one pastor say it this week. Mo, if you're an American, your garbage disposal eats more than most people in the world. Now, I don't have a garbage disposal because I got a septic system. But my trash can probably eats more food than the world. I take that for granted. I, I want something else. And really what that is, is a wrestle in my own heart of me not trusting that God is at work just because life doesn't go the way that I want it to. And it's me taking it for granted. And so I, I want you to think about that this week. I got lots of questions for you to think about on this sermon sheet, okay? But I think it's good for you and it's good for me because I think we have to think about these things. How has God directed your life in the past? What provisions has he given you or is he giving you? And think about those things. Remember those things. Meditate on those things. Because in those times of anxiety, at least for me, I have to remind myself of those. And it helps me stay grounded. It does. And the other thing I want you to think about is, what can you do to remember these things more? I'll never forget when I was a... Uh, um, engineer, I, I did this study experiencing with God, and one of the things that Henry Blackaby talks about is creating these altar, these mental altars in our lives. Now you're like, well, we're talking about idols, so we got to stay away from altars. That's not what he's talking about. In the Old Testament, there's often times when God acted, they would give a sacrifice to God of Isaac and Jacob, and 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 they would say they would give it a name. And then what they would do is they would leave those stones throughout the country so that when the people of Israel would walk past them, they would say, that's where God acted this way. That's where God acted that way. And I would encourage you to think about those things that you and I can do to think about those times when God has acted. So when we take him for granted, we're reminded of that. It could just be a Bible verse that you have on, on some spot, or it could be even something that you have that reminds you of the way that God worked. But think about those things that you can do to remember so that we can remember that the, the race is worth it, that God has been faithful to us in the past and he'll be faithful for us in the future. But let's not be arrogant and think that we are not unlike the Israelites and that just because God moved big in their way and they are took it for granted that we can't do the same. That we often take God for granted and don't remember the way that he has worked. Paul says that what happens when we forget that God is at work and when we don't give him the proper credit and the proper glory is that we turn our hearts to evil things. 
And he says God wasn't pleased with the Israelites because they set their hearts on evil things. And so he encourages the, the people of Corinth to learn the lesson that they had. And he, and he lists four different things that happen in the Old Testament. Now, I'm not going to list all the situations where these happen because, quite frankly, if you look at the Old Testament and you look at the wilderness, they happen over and over again. But there's four themes that he highlights, and, and I'll, I'll mention a little bit where they happen in the Old Testament, but the theme is the most important thing, okay? The first one that he highlights, the mistake that they made, the warning that he gives, is that they worshipped idols. He says, do not be idolaters, as some of them were, as it was written. The people sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry. Now, that's actually a quote for the time when God had just worked and Moses was up on the, uh, in their lives. He'd drawn them through uh, all these things that I talked about. And Moses went up to um, the mountain to get the Ten Commandments. And he was up there a little bit longer than the people expected. And so they freaked out. And so they said to Aaron, hey, make us an idol that we can worship. And they made the golden calf. And right after he made the golden calf, it says that they sat down and they ate and they drank and they got up involved in revelry. Now, it's interesting that Paul brings this up because the whole conversation is about eating food that's been sacrificed to idols. And so he ties this. There's a weave here with what he said earlier. But he says, be careful that you don't worship idols. Now, again, we can look at this text and we can say, well, you know, I don't worship a trinket. I, that's just a stone. But really, the heart of idolatry is that it's just loving something more than God. Well, if I think about idolatry in that terms, I got to admit that there are certain things that I can make a higher priority than God. And, and really what it can be is that that can become more of my affections than God himself. And so what Paul says is be careful that we don't put in certain things above God. And they aren't always bad things. Sometimes they're good things. But we make those a more of a big priority and that they have a bigger part of our heart than we care to admit. And so what he warns is, Make God the main focus and don't let these other things take too high of a priority in our lives. And so the question that I have for you today, for all of us, me too, is what things do you love more than God? What things have you given more of a priority than God? The second thing that he warns them against is committing sexual immorality. Again, in this one, we can see there's a story in Numbers 25 where what happened is the Moab uh, women got the men to, to go into the, the temples and worship the idols, and there was a sexual component to that. Again, this is what's happening in Corinth. And so Paul says, be wary of this. Don't get caught up into all this stuff. This is your former way of life. And again, we can get caught up into the, the whole sexual immorality and focus just on that, which it's important. But really what Paul is saying is, don't make your own individual desires, those things that you think you need in that moment, more important than God. And in that sense, if we, we broaden it that way, well, then maybe that speaks to our hearts more. There are all kinds of things I think I need. There are desires in my heart. And, and, and I want them now when I want them because I'm selfish. And Paul says, be warned about that. Be warned about that. If you make your desires the most important thing, then you can easily wander away. You can make your desires more important than God. And so we need to think about that. We need to wrestle with that. What desires are more important to you, most important to you? Again, they don't have to be bad things. It, it could be good things, but if they become the ultimate thing in our life to where they become the ultimate focus rather than what's, on really, what's really important, well, then our priorities are out of balance. We're going to be focused more on ourselves and we're going to forget God and we're going to be in a pretty tough spot, is what Paul is saying. The other thing that they said is that they tested God. They placed themselves in constant judgment of God, really. He says, we should not test Christ as some of them did and were killed by snakes. Now, again, if you want to find examples of testing God, there are all kinds of them in the wilderness. It seems like the people of Israel were always angry. They were always upset. And they always said, if God really cared about us, and that's why he took us out of Egypt, then he would do this. This is like a question they raised to Moses repeatedly. If I was Moses, I'd be like, oh my word. But really what they're doing when they say, if God does this, he loves me, is they're placing themselves in a constant of judgment. God, is God really worthy? Is he really good? 
Is he really God if he, if he, and the only way that he's really God is if he does what I want him to do, which is quite real, frankly a pretty arrogant place to sit, don't you think? When he's the creator of the universe and I'm just a little peon. But that's what they were doing. They were constantly saying and testing God. Now, now we can do this in small ways. I, I, I can be like, God, Hey, there's road construction. I really need to get to my meeting. Can you please, please, you know, park the freeway so I can get through like the Red Sea? I can play these gymnastics in my own head, you know? But sometimes it's bigger things. There, there's cries in our hearts. And, and God, if you really care about me, you'll, you'll do this. And, and there are godly things. They're, they're good things. There may not even be selfish things. Can, can you bring my kid back to, to Jesus? Or can you protect me from this thing? But if our faith in God is only there, if God does what we want him to do, then we are in the place of authority. God is God. And we should love him for what, who he is and what he's done in our lives. And sometimes things may not go the way that we want them to go. And it's going to make us question. But if we always make God a bad guy, if he doesn't do what we want him to do, we need to be careful because that puts us in a place of judgment. And it's a very dangerous place to be. So the question that I want you to think about this morning, and we need to wrestle with this week, is how do you judge or test God? What are those ways that you say, God, I will only care about you if you do this? I want to warn you, Paul warns you, that those kind of conditions are a dangerous footing to put yourself on. Because it will ultimately crumble. crumble. The last thing that he raises is that they grumbled against God. He says, and do not grumble as some of them did. And again, here again, if you want to look at the number of spots that they grumbled, it is huge. I mean, if, they, if there is a, a, a term that uh, characterized the people of Israel as they're going through the wilderness, grumbling would be it. Again, I would like to say that, like, I don't ever struggle with grumble, but then I would be lying. It's so easy for us when we're going through life and we face difficult situations to have this attitude towards God of just being frustrated and angry. Now, I want to be careful here because Job, when Job goes through things, he brings those emotions to God. He says, hey, God, this is really hard. I need your help in all of this. But at the end of Job, what he says is, you're God and I'm not, and I'm going to trust you. And so, yes, we can bring these emotions to God, but when we start putting this accusation on God that he is a bad guy because our life doesn't go the way that we expect it to, then we move to an unhealthy grumbling. Does that make sense? There can be this, God, I don't know why you're doing this, and this is really hard. That's, I would say, a healthy wrestling with God because you're, you're bringing your feelings, your emotion to God. But ultimately, and, he, and even we can be frustrated with God, but, but ultimately we got to be careful that we don't just sit and wallow in that and, and that it becomes this constant grumbling where ultimately we doubt God's goodness and, and we start to allow this idea to creep into our hearts that, well, maybe God isn't as good as he claims to be. Maybe he isn't as faithful as he claims to be. And we let that have more of a voice in our heads than we care to admit. I say this kind of, I don't know, it's been a while since I've said it, but when we suffer, we need to suffer in stereo, okay? In one, one channel, we need to have that, God, this hurts, this is hard, and we need to do that. But we also need to speak just as loudly the truth about who God is and what he's done in our lives. That he is faithful, that he is directing our lives, that he is good. And even though we may not understand it, we are going to put our hope and trust in him. And if we silence that channel to where all we do is talk about the, the bad, then we're in the fear spot of dangerous spot of doing what the people of Israel did. It's both. Does that make sense? So we need to be careful there, is what Paul sa or it says, that we don't grumble against them. And that we don't become doubters of if God is good. 
God is good. Yeah. And, and even though we can't understand it, he can use even the hardest things ultimately for his good and his glory, even though it may cause us pain. There's a song that I haven't even told Brian yet, but I, I want us to learn. It's by City of Lights. It's called For Your Glory and Your Good. <laughs> Go listen to it. It's amazing. And, and what it is, is this declaration that no matter if I'm in the valley, no matter if I'm in a good spot, I, I'm going to remind myself of your glory and your goodness. That you can use even the hardest things to bring about good in my life. And so that's the truth that we need to remind ourselves. And if we don't, then we can be like the Israelites where we move to the spot of grumbling. And so here's the question that I have for you to ponder and me ponder. Do you doubt God? How do you doubt God's goodness in your life? Look, we have a lot of difficult situations in this church. I do not want to minimize that. We have health challenges. We have relationship challenges. We have all kinds of things that are happening. And, and, and don't want to minimize that suffering. But the encouragement that we have is that we also remind ourselves of God's goodness. As I was going through this text, it's kind of you get this mental checklist in my brain about, okay, well, this makes sense. I mean, he talks about the race. we got to put in the effort. He warns us that, you know, we need to watch out for all these things. And inside of my head, I, I kind of thought, well, it seems like i got to do all these things, and it feels like almost pressure sometimes. And that's why I love how Paul ends this passage. He ends it in kind of an interesting way in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 11, but it's a powerful way. He says, don't put your faith in yourself, put it in God. Because sometimes when we hear all these warnings, we can think, oh man, okay, now I got to stress out. Am I really, you know, am I doubting God? Am I judging him? Am I, I mean, and it can feel like a checklist and it can actually almost create more stress and anxiety in us. And what Paul says is, I'm going to give you these warnings. I'm going to encourage you to move forward. But I also want you to hear this word of encouragement that it's not just about you. It's about God at work in your life. And so don't put your faith in yourself because you're going to mess up. But put your faith in God. He said, these things happen to them as an example and were written down as a warning for us on whom the culmination of the ages has come. So that if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. Now, the way that I read that, it says... Overconfident in yourself will lead to your destruction. There are all kinds of problems that talk about this. I think we all know that, right? There's an overconfidence in yourself will lead to your destruction. And what he says is, what happened with the Israelites is they, they put too much stock in themselves, in their wants, in their desires, in, in everything. And he said that overconfidence ultimately led them to this destruction. God had worked in a powerful way, and they ignored it. Why? Because they focused on themselves rather than God. But he also says, there's a sense of encouragement here, because he says, place your confidence instead in God's faithfulness. I love how he ends it. He gives this big challenge. Run the race. Fight the battle. You know, don't do these four things like the, like the Israelites did. And you're like, okay, I'm feeling helpless. And Paul says, that's exactly where you need to be. Because here's the thing. When you're overconfident and you feel like you have it all figured out, that's when you're ready to fall. Instead, what you need to do in those moments is say, God, I can't do it on my own and I need your help. And here's the truth that Corinthians 10, 13 says is that God is faithful and he will be at work in your lives. He won't let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. Now that one is hard because there's temptations that I give in to, but I want you to think in the long run of the race, there may be temptations where we go into, but what he's saying is there are going to be times when you want to give up and where you feel overwhelmed by everything that's coming your way, but don't give up, not because you're so great and you have all the skills and ability, but because God is great and he is faithful and he will give you the strength and the power and the hope and everything you need in that moment. He says he will also provide you a way out so that you endure it. So when we're suffering, we say, God, this is overwhelming and I can't even handle it on my own, but I'm going to trust 
that God, you can use it for your glory and your good. I'm going to trust that you can use even this difficult pain in my life to help me get further down the road so that when my life is complete, I get that prize of eternal life with you. And sometimes when life is, quite frankly, the most messed up, what we need to focus our hearts and our attentions on is that life that awaits us. That life that awaits us is a life in the presence of God without any effects of sin. I want you to think about African American spirituals. What do they focus on? It's the coming of Christ. Soon and very soon. You know, we are going to see the King. Their life right now is hard, but they see the prize that's awaiting them, and they focus on that. And what Paul says, when we're in the throngs of difficult things, that's what we need to do. And we need to trust that God will be faithful. Because he's already proven that on the cross. He saw us in the muck of our sin, and he acted on our behalf. And he liberated us from that sin. But he's not done with this yet. He's got a, a plan for us that we get to spend all eternity with him. And he'll use whatever it is that we go through ultimately to give us that prize that will not fade and it will not perish. And that is life with him for all eternity. That's what we're shooting for. That's what we're aiming for. And I don't know about you, but I praise God that my ability to get there is not based on me, but rather on God's faithfulness. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. You have just watched a sermon from Crossway Church in Battleground, Washington. We hope that you enjoyed it, and we'd love to have you come join us for a worship service on Sunday at 10 a.m. at 311 North Parkway Avenue in Battleground, Washington. If you'd like to find more information about us online, you can find it at crosswaychurchwa.com.